I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. <clears throat> then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Then the anger of the Lord burns against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, and even I, will be your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff, with which you shall perform the signs. The most rewarding studies out of the Old Testament are character studies, and apparently the Holy Spirit thought the same thing, and so in Hebrews chapter 11 we had this catalog of character studies in regard to faith. That was the basis of our Cloud of Witnesses study that we did on Life Group Sundays for about 18 months. We've now transitioned to a study of James on Life Group Sundays, and we'll be back to that next Sunday dealing with the first part of James chapter 4. But you had provided some wonderful recommendations and suggestions for that cloud of witnesses study, and we were able to work through most of those. One that I don't believe that was on anybody's list is one that we're going to be talking about this morning. Just to remind you why uh, it's okay to go all Old Testament on Sunday morning, why it's important that we periodically take time to, to look back at what has been recorded about things past. Uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 4, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. What was written about things that happened 1500 years before Christ even showed up on the scene was written for our instruction. It was too late for those people to learn lessons that were written down. Hopefully they were learning along the way. Hopefully as they failed, as they made mistakes, as they stumbled and God helped pick them up and dust them off and send them on their way, hopefully they were learning, but the, by the time this is written down, their lives are about over. And same thing with 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verse 11. These things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In that chapter, Paul has talked about numerous failures of the people in the wilderness. And again, by the time those are recorded, by the time they're written down, it's not going to do that generation much good. It's for the succeeding generations, even for their spiritual descendants like us in Jesus Christ. And so the object of our, our study uh, this morning is, is not listed in that great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, yet he's such a vital character in the unfolding of God's story. Uh, as one of our very, very important spiritual forefathers. From that period of time, we most often remember his uh, younger brother, Moses, and yet his right-hand man throughout all those years in the wilderness is Aaron. He's going to be with Moses every time Moses appears uh, before Pharaoh. He's going to be with him when he leads the people through the Red Sea and through every incident that takes place in the wilderness. As we're going to find out, Moses and Aaron die in the same year, uh, probably not too far apart from one another. And so what Moses experiences in the wilderness, Aaron experiences in the wilderness. And I'm convinced Moses wouldn't have done what he did, couldn't have done what he did unless Aaron had been there by his side. When you look at the family tree, you see how Amram uh, is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath. And Amram, we're told in uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, even though his name isn't mentioned there, it 
says that this man of the tribe of Levi marries a woman from the tribe of Levi. You find out later on it was actually his father's sister, Jochebed was. But that family is blessed with three children. So Aaron has two siblings, uh, two, uh, one of them older, one of them younger. In chapter, if I can find the reference here, chapter 7, verse 7, it's where we learn that Aaron is the older brother of Moses because when they appear before Pharaoh for the first time, it says that Moses was 80 years old, Aaron was 83. So Aaron's three years older than his brother, but we assume that Miriam is seven, uh, several years older given her role in the story about the birth of Moses, how he was kept hidden at home for three months by his parents when they felt they couldn't hide him safely any longer. You remember the story of putting him in the basket, taking him down to the Nile River, putting him in the bulrushes, and off in the distance, off at, at some uh, short distance, is Miriam watching to see what happens. And so my guess is that she's several years older. If you're into birth order things, uh, Aaron is a middle child. He's the middle child. Maybe you can read his story and see some middle child characteristics as we go through this. But I don't know, I don't see Kim Keel this morning. She would know this individual that I'm talking about. Mike and Karen would know him as well, but they're at the family retreat. There was a group of older men that I played golf with at the Walnut Hill Church in Dallas. Uh, Bill Campbell was the one I was just thinking about, but Frank Crowder, Howard Self, these guys had played down at Stevens Park for 30 years. And they were a joy to play with because they just ragged on one another constantly. And I was the new kid on the block. I was probably the age of their grandchildren, so I was, I was rather safe. And I just loved playing with them and hearing them go at one another. The second hole at Stevens Park is a fairly short par four, and over to the right, down a slight slope is a wide creek with all kinds of reeds and bulrushes and everything. Bill was known to, to slice his ball fairly badly, and sure enough, he hits his drive down toward the creek. And These guys were retired, and with the extended time they had, they would look for a ball for 10 minutes. I guess it was worth it to try to find it rather than buying more on their retirement income, but anyway, Bill knocked around down there. About the hardest I ever laughed at Stevens Park was when Bill trudged back up from the creek, and we asked him, did you find your ball? He said, no. Didn't find the ball, but it was the most amazing thing. There was the cutest little baby in a basket down there <laughs> among all those reeds. And every time I read about the birth of Moses, I think of Bill and looking for his golf ball down, down around those reeds. So we're assuming that Miriam is sev several years older. Um, Aaron's wife, we know, her name was Elisheba. She bears him four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. When we get to the text that was read for us by Robert just a few moments ago, this follows on the narrative that begins in chapter 3 with the appearance of God to Moses at the burning bush. And as one of our young ones so very well pointed out during the children's lesson this morning, Moses was the guy who makes all the excuses. Uh, his, his first excuse is, uh, what if they ask me what your name is? What if they say God really didn't appear to you when I go back and tell them about what's transpired on the mountain? And God says, will you tell them my name is I am who I am. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. And then the excuses continue. Uh, what if they still don't believe me? Well, what kind of signs can I show them? And that's where that wonderful lesson comes in. God just asks him, I can use whatever you've got. What's in your hand? What was in his hand was the staff. He throws it down. It becomes the snake. Sticks his hand. He's got a hand as well that's holding the staff. Sticks that in, into his clothing, pulls it out, it's leprous, puts it back, pulls it back out, and it's clean and, and, and pure as it was before. And then he gets to this excuse that we find that, that Robert read for us about not being a very eloquent person. Uh, appearing before the ruler of the nation that pretty much has its way and has sway over the entire ancient Near East at that time. Moses says, I'm not up to that. And that's when God says, well, let's talk about your brother Aaron. 
And in chapter 7, verse 1, uh, God says to, to Moses, you are going to be like God to Pharaoh. Aaron is going to be your prophet. And so don't worry about what you're going to say. Aaron will speak for you. And it's beautiful to read the rest of chapter 4 because it does describe, just as God said in the text that Robert read, Aaron, your brother is going to be coming out to meet you in the wilderness. He's going to be glad to see you. You know why he was going to be glad to see him? Because he hadn't seen him in 40 years. He probably didn't see Moses much when they were growing up, if at all. And when he's 40 years old, Moses has to flee Egypt. He spends the next 40 years in the wilderness of Midian. Uh, after he marries, he, he works for his father-in-law, Jeth, uh, Jethro or Reuel. And for those of you who may be around 80, maybe a little short of 80, maybe a, a little over 80, think about having not seen a brother or sister since 1974. Uh, how would you feel? If, if you got to see them, I think you would be, I would hope you would be happy to see them. And that's the kind of reaction that Aaron has when he sees his brother. He, he runs to him, he kisses him, and then they go back to Egypt together. Moses has been away for 40 years, and Aaron relates all the words to the people that the Lord has shared with Moses. And it's wonderful to see that in chapter 4, verse uh, 30 that things begin to unfold just like God said they would. I will tell you, Aaron will tell the people. And as we go through this entire next section of Exodus, it follows that formula. God tells Moses to say to Aaron this. And then Aaron commu communicates it either to Pharaoh or to, uh, to the people of Israel. As you read the rest of, of the text in Exodus uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy that involves Moses as the leader of God's people, you begin to see that Moses wouldn't be there if it weren't for Aaron. Because when one name is mentioned more times than not, the other name is mentioned as well. And they must have had a, a really wonderful relationship as, as brothers. And I don't know if this ever came up. You've probably seen this before. Fishing probably would not have been one of the favorite activities that, that, that they would do. Thank you for that, by the way. I had uh, I'd seen that before, and then someone gifted me with that this week as well, as they knew I was preparing for this lesson. But if you want to hazard a guess as to how many times their names appear together, when it says God spoke to Moses and Aaron, or Pharaoh said to Moses and Aaron, or the people grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the people rose up against Moses and Aaron. Seventy-three times uh, it appears in the text. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 6 says, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Psalm 77, verse uh, 20. Uh, speaking of God, you led your people like a flock, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Both are credited with leadership of the people. Uh, both serve as co-leaders of Israel. And when you read the text carefully, you start finding out that things that are attributed to Moses that we just knew we saw Charlton Heston do in the Ten Commandments were actually performed by Aaron. Uh, now, out in the wilderness, it's Moses who, at the instruction of the Lord, throws down his staff and it becomes a snake. When they're before Pharaoh, it's Aaron who throws down his staff and it becomes a serpent. And you remember the sorcerers, the magicians, the conjurers of Egypt are able to do the same thing, except Aaron's staff slash serpent uh, consumes all of the others. Uh, it is Aaron who was told by Moses to stretch out his staff over the waters of the Nile so that they would become blood. It's Aaron who again stretches out his staff over the Nile and causes this plague of frogs to arise from the river. It's Aaron who strikes the ground with his staff and causes this plague of gnats to arise from the dust of the earth. The first of the signs which could not be duplicated by the magicians of Egypt. And so their response, finally, they're a little slow to come around. 
But finally their response is, this is the finger of God. So in this one sign to Pharaoh, and then in regard to three of the ten plagues, it's actually the hand of Aaron that God uses rather than the hand of Moses. It's Aaron who's instructed to take a pot of manna after it begins to fall, this bread from heaven that would sustain them six days a week, six days out of seven for 40 years until they entered the land and began to eat the fruit of the land. On that day, when they could take care of themselves now, God stopped sending them manna. But Moses says, Aaron, you take a pot of this and you keep this as a memorial of, the God, of God's provisions for his people. And then one of the things we often associate with Aaron is his role in Exodus chapter 17 at uh, the battle of Rephidim against uh, the army of Amalek. Moses has sent Joshua with the army down into the valley to, to fight the Amalekites. Moses says, I'm going up on the hill and I'm going to stand here with my staff. And the text describes that as long as he is able to stand and hold up his staff, the army of Israel prevails. Remember, he's, he's well over 80 now by the time we get to this text. Uh, even a young man would tire over a period of time in that position. If you've worked up over your head uh, doing something and you typically don't do that, you, you know how hard it is to do. And so Aaron and her sit Moses down on a rock, and they, they hold up his hands. I don't know if uh, Kevin and Mignon are here today or others of you who have been to Israel. The image in the lower left is the menorah that's outside the Knesset in Jerusalem, the Israeli parliament. And the menorah is adorned with scenes from the history of Israel. And I don't know if, yeah, it does work. Uh, this one right here is this image right here. Aaron and her holding up the hands of Moses. And already we, we've seen in their relationship that Aaron is going to be to Moses like Andrew was to Peter. He's going to be like Saul was to Barnabas. Uh, excuse me, that like Barnabas was to, to Saul, like Barnabas was to John Mark, like Paul is going to be to Timothy, like Paul is going to be to Titus. And we have this beautiful reminder here of the power of encouragement, the power of support, the power of affirmation, the power of, of inspiration. Don't ever underestimate, don't ever doubt uh, how much power is there. Uh, when, when it comes to your families, when it comes to your husband or your wife, when it comes to your children, and the encouragement that they need from, from you, there's no way to calculate the mileage that can come out of a simple expression of support and encouragement. Uh, church leaders will tell you the same thing. Uh, Jeff Watson has mentioned in Life Group a couple of times something that Marvin Phillips used to say in regard to encouraging church leaders, specifically elders. Uh, he said Marvin would say, uh, what, what was it? Praise them to greatness? Where'd Jeff go? Say, okay, all right. I'll have to ask him for confirmation later. But I think it was praise them to greatness. Praise them to greatness. And there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, they will seek to live up to the praise that, that they have received. And so we see this in a very physical way there on the, the hill above the valley at Rephidim, but figuratively, there is such a, a great lesson here. Aaron gets to see some manifestation of, of the glory of God. This is in Exodus 24. It's at, at the beginning of the, the story where Moses goes up on the mountain. Ultimately, he's going to spend 40 days there. But he takes with him Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. Moses and Joshua are going to go a little further. But all of them see God some form of God, some manifestation of God, not in his full glory. Even Moses isn't going to see him in his full glory. But they, they sit and eat. They share a meal there in the presence of God. And under his feet is, is like a sea of sapphire, blue and clear. Aaron gets to see that. And Moses leaves the people under the charge of and in the care of Aaron 
and her. Uh, later in the story, Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, it's by the command of God uh, that Moses and Aaron numbered the people. 603,550 people who were able to fight, to go to war. And based on that number, we figure two and a half to, to three million people total in the congregation of Israel. Uh, one of the stories where God's choice of Aaron, and we think about God's choice of Moses, he just as clearly chose Aaron to lead with his brother. Uh, but it's in Numbers chapter 16 that we read about some other men of the tribe of Levi who aren't quite satisfied with the work that's detailed for them to do in regard to the tabernacle. They become a, a little jealous of Aaron and Moses, and so they challenge them along with uh, some cohorts, Dathan, Abiram, and On, and 250 other leaders from Levi. And you think about how intimidating that must have been. You've got Moses and Aaron, and then you've got these spiritual thug types, and then you've got 250 people behind them. It would be a little intimidating. You might see a coup coming. Uh, you might think we just need to capitulate. And yet God shows clearly his choice of Moses, his choice of Aaron. Uh, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, on all of them are destroyed. The ground opens up, swallows up Korah and, and his household, covers them back up, uh, sort of buries them alive. Fire comes down, consumes the 250 who had arisen against Moses and Aaron. And amazingly, the people blame the whole incident on Moses and Aaron. And they say, this is your fault that this is happening. So God sends a plague among the people and this is where Aaron shines once again. At Moses' instruction as death is sweeping through the camp and 14,000 plus ultimately are killed, Aaron takes his censer, his fire pan, he puts coals from the, the uh, altar of burnt offering into the censer, he takes incense and, and puts it on it and he takes his stand between the living and the dead. It's like he can see where the line of death is going and he runs into the midst of that line and takes a stand between the living and the dead. And the plague is abated. God turns his anger away. In the next chapter, uh, chapter 17, that's where God gives this bonus confirmation. Aaron is told to take his staff, take his rod. The leaders of the other 11 tribes are, are told to do the same thing. Their rods are put before the, the testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, left overnight. The next morning, it, we talk about Aaron's rod that, that budded. The text says that his rod budded, it blossomed, uh, it produced ripe almonds overnight. And you may not have known that almonds could get ripe. Uh, I didn't know that until we lived in Monrovia, Liberia when I was a kid. Right across the road was an almond tree. Outside the kernel that's inside the seed, it's surrounded by a fleshy fruit. And when that thing ripens, it breaks open and the outer shell begins to dry. And then we ultimately get out the kernel that, that we call an almond. All that happens overnight. And this is something you want to hang on to. So ultimately that rod and the pot of manna that, that Aaron had gotten together and the tablets of stone are ultimately housed in the Ark of the Covenant. So you might think that Aaron's resume is just full of all these glowing things. Yeah, his life had highlights like our lives. His life had some, some low points as well. Probably none much lower than Exodus cha chapter 32. I mentioned to you before that when Moses is on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he has left the congregation in the care and under the charge of Aaron and her. 40 days is a long time, especially if you think somebody's just going to be gone for a day or two. And so the people become restless. They, they come to Aaron and say, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Let's make an image of our God. And so Aaron takes from the people golden earrings, fashions them into a golden calf and declares, this is the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Not only did he build the calf, fashion the calf out of gold, he built an altar, he proclaimed a, a feast day for the next day. 
And rather than just confessing when Moses, his brother, catches up with him, he uses this uh, amazing, la amazingly lame excuse, I threw the gold into the fire, out came the calf. Um, verse 35 of that chapter, the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. The thing that impresses me here, if, if you don't believe the picture of God in the Old Testament is a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness and second chances, just read this story again. He hasn't even been consecrated to be the high priest yet. They work through this. The high priest who's going to make morning and evening sacrifices every day, the high priest who on the day of atonement is going to offer sacrifice for himself and for the priesthood and for all uh, the, the people of Israel is a former idolater. A man who, against what he knew to be right, makes this golden calf, makes the altar, and, and leads the people in idolatry. It, it encourages me uh, that God can take a man who has made a mistake like that and use him so powerfully as a leader among his people. He was not beyond petty jealousy. He was not beyond sibling rival, rivalry. And so in the beginning of Numbers chapter 12, it says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. The man Moses was very humble, more humble than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. When God calls you out, it's serious business. So the three of them came out. The Lord came down in a pillar of clouds, stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth. Deuteronomy 34, it says they spoke face to face. Even openly and not in dark sayings. He beholds the form of God. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So we have the golden calf in Exodus 32. We have this challenge to his brother in Numbers chapter 12, which results in Miriam's temporary leprosy. And then in Numbers 20, we won't take the time to read the text there, but he is as culpable at the rock at Meribah as Moses is. When Moses is told to, to speak to the rock, to bring water for the people in anger, he strikes the rock and he takes glory to himself. Shall we provide water for you? And we know that this is the incident that bars Moses from entering the promised land. It also bars his brother from entering the promised land. So as we're, we're bringing the uh, study to a close this morning, if you want to turn with me to Numbers chapter 33, kind of jump to the end of the story here. I'm apparently not looking in the right place. All right, somebody help me out. Death of Aaron. I would say this is embarrassing, but I'm old enough that it's really not anymore. I had numbers 33, 39. 38, thank you. See, that's what your family's for. Numbers 38. 33, 38. That is still not the text I was looking for. Hang on a tick. All right. Let me just summarize this. I'll get back with you on it. What did you have, Gerald? 2022? It's like a bidding war going on here. <laughs> there we are. It's 2023. All right, sorry about that, congregation. 
Verse 23 of Numbers 20, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the sons of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up to Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar. So Aaron will be gathered to his people and will die there. So Moses did just as the Lord had commanded, and they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron 30 days. It's not going to be much long after this that, that Moses dies, and they mourn for him for 30 days. As much honor in death for Aaron as there had been for Moses. Aaron is such an important individual, plays such a, a critical role in the unfolding of God's story because he is the first high priest in a high priesthood that's going to continue for about 1,500 years until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And yet we know that he wasn't a perfect priest. That sacrifice had to be made for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. In Psalm 106, verse 16, Aaron is called the Holy One of God. In the sense that he was consecrated, in the sense that he was separated, called for this special purpose. But we know who the true Holy One of God is. In his communion thoughts, Robert mentioned Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, now consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. A little later in the book of Hebrews, and we'll close with this since time is gone, uh, but if you'll read with me from Hebrews chapter 7, let's go to this one. Thanks, Corey. Beginning in verse 15 of Hebrews 7. This is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the order, uh, excuse me, according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. You became a high priest in Israel by being the son of a high priest. Just a physical requirement. You could be a good person, a bad person, a righteous person, an evil person, someone intimate with God or someone not very interested at all in God. And you could still serve as a high priest. Jesus becomes high priest on the basis of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, your priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there's a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it is not without an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath, but Jesus with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn, will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, the Levitical priest, Aaronic priests on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he's able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it's fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. And this Holy One of God, this Holy One of God, like Aaron, took his stand between the living and the dead. When he was lifted up, that he might draw all men to him. Except the, the, the main difference is there, there were none living spiritually. He was raised up on behalf of all of the dead, dead because of sin. And through our great high priest, Jesus Christ, we can live. I hope that as Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10, 11 say that 
things that were written about things that happened a long time ago have been instructive. They have been encouraging. That, that God could use someone like Aaron, guilty of so many grave mistakes, and yet continuing to be formed into the image that God wanted him to be. If that's your need today, to be renewed, transformed, changed, redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, we would love to assist you with that in being immersed in his name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Holy Spirit as well for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need to return to a, a greater faithfulness of discipleship in your walk with Christ, if there are just burdens on your heart that you want to share and need assistance and, and help in bearing, we would love to assist you with that. Our shepherds will be at the front to receive you as we stand and sing.